You are watching WhatsApp Punta Cana with Christy Mayo, una americana italiana en la República Dominicana since 2013. A teacher at heart, but her curiosity has sparked new opportunities. Director, businesswoman, humanitarian, talk show host. La curiosa directora has decided to become the student. Go behind the scenes to get a closer look at what this country is all about. And share is here with you. So, if you love everything Dominicana, stay tuned. This is WhatsApp Punta Cana with Christy Mayo. Welcome to tonight's episode of What's Up Punta Cana with Christy Maggio. I am excited to have you all here with me tonight. And I just want you to know that I have a really special guest who is with me this evening. It is Greg Reed. For over 25 years, Greg has inspired millions of people to take personal responsibility to step into the potential of their greatness. And as such, his life of contribution has been recognized by government leaders, a foreign princess, as well as uh, many people in education, business, and the entertainment industry itself. He has published over 100 books, uh, including 32 bestsellers in 45 different languages. Um, it's quite remarkable. And this from a man who, growing up, was not good in very, very good in school academically and who grew up with dyslexia and you're going to hear what he does and his advice on how to overcome the struggles and obstacles that you might be facing today so that you can ultimately um, be just as successful that he is and that so many other people in this world are today. And one of the key things that he talks about today is networking, is partnering and mastermind, which is ultimately surrounding yourself with people and experiencing and getting advice or as he calls it counsel from those who have been there before uh, and, and so he's also now working towards uh doing some movies productions as well as uh, a tv show um he is the producer of the oscar qualified film wish man um based on the creator of the make a wish foundation um it's streaming on netflix now He as well has a little eight-year-old son and we're going to talk to him about him a little bit and what it's like to be a dad and raising um, a child at this moment and some of the lessons that he instills in and the values that he instills in his son as well. So I want to, without further ado, uh, present to you my interview with Greg Reed and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I want to welcome you today to What's Up Punta Cana with Christy Maggio. Thank you so much for being here and taking your time um, to share with me and with uh, my audience all about Greg Reed. How are you today? I am always good and so good even I want to be me sometimes. <laughs> 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 that's that's excellent you know who better to be than than you right yeah, so, sure. you know yeah. I, i i i got a quick little story of that I, i met my hero his name is brian tracy he's a, mm -hmm. a best-selling author for sales and business and I, i asked him one time i go brian what's it like being you and he stopped in his tracks and turned around and says that's a great question he goes but don't be me he goes just be the best you when you were a kid your mom said just be you and people embrace you Mm -hmm. And she goes, don't be Tony Robbins, don't be Les Brown, just be yourself. That little aha, I went and I got rid of all my three-piece suits. I changed all my mannerisms, the PowerPoints, all the stuff I was trying to follow other people's mm -hmm. footsteps. And I started doing my own version and I embraced that opportunity and became a little bit of a success story. I think it's really important though. I mean, what you just said is that's very key because a lot of times people want to be Tony Robbins or want to be Greg Reed or want to be, you know, uh, Brian Tracy or whomever, or Les Brown. But I think the key part is to take, you know, the, the 
characteristics or the personality, the, the things that are bringing you the success, the, the ideas like that, but then make it your own, you know, learn how you succeeded from those moments, but then be you because nobody else is, is like you. Right. So, All right. I, so I, I, I got a kind of an interesting thing. I rarely ever share this, but next week I'm at 33 years sobriety. So I just don't drink, smoke drugs. It's, it's, it's my choice. And what's interesting is I remember I checked myself in one of those rehab centers when I was like 24 years old and I just didn't want to use anymore. And I was going to leave because everyone kept telling me what to do. Put a bumper sticker on my car, go to a chant, get a spot. I go, I just mm-hmm. don't want to it. And, and, and I was going to leave and there's a sand volleyball court. It was a yuppie place. And he says, grab a handful of sand. And this little input changed my life forever. At 24 years old, I'm so glad I learned it early. He said, grab a handful of sand. He says, when people give you their input or their, their advice, they're not trying to mess you up. It's just the only thing they know so they're giving you from the feedback from their experience. He mm-hmm. says, so rather than say, yeah, but, or argue it, just say, thank you very much. And if it works for you, keep it. If not, let it slip through your fingers. But by not saying, yeah, but you don't have to argue it and put up negative energy. So someone says, hey, go to a you know meeting and say, oh, that makes sense. Thank you very much. That doesn't work for me. Hey, do this. That doesn't work for me. But as you close your hand, the things that do becomes your program. And that's mm-hmm. what will keep you long lasting. Well, I did that in business. People say, this is what you should do. Thank you very much. This is how you raise your kid. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. And as that is, those are the aspects of everything I do in my personal, my business life based on that philosophy today. That's incredible. And that's really great advice as well, because a lot of times what works for some may not work for others. You know, you could take it and it's always not, it's always a good experience to see what works for other people. And, you know, it may work for you. It may not. And like you said, if it does great, if it doesn't, then let it go. And um, I think a lot of times people like to argue too much with my opinion on how to do things and your opinion on how to do things. Well, why can't they they both work as long as they get you to the same end goal, right? I agree. And and sometimes, you know, what your skill set might be a little bit easier than the next. It'd be like going to Michael Jordan and say, you know, how do you do that? And he goes, oh, you just run down the court, you jump in the air, right. you spin around, stick your tongue out and slam. Oh, what do you t-? That's easy. Well, exactly. That, that, that is true. But for another person, it's not so much. A lot of times people go up and they go, how do you publish so many books? How do you do this thing? I go, oh, it's easy. You just run down the court right. and spin around, right? Because to me, mm-hmm. That's my normal, but it doesn't mean it's a normal for everybody else. Well, I want to spin kind of into that this, now that you brought up writing books, because I, I know that after doing a little bit of research in your background, you didn't, uh, you didn't graduate high school, is that correct? Or you didn't go to college? Right. I barely graduated high school. I don't have no idea how <laughs> they passed me. I mean, because I got D's and F's and whatnot. I guess they just wanted me out of there. And I never went to college. Uh, and yet it was so funny when I was a, a, a kid, I was 17. My dad at that time says, hey, go to school, go to college, extend, you know, work on your education. I said, nah, I just want to get into sales and marketing. I like talking to people and doing mm-hmm. this education. And he says, boy, you're never going to make a living talking to people. <laughs> and I remember I uh, said the first time I got a six-figure income, I was still in my 20s, and I sent the W-2 home to my dad and said, Dear Dad, remember when you said I'd never make money? And now it's the running joke because it's what I do for a living. Wow. But you were never, I mean, now you have, I don't know, over published over a hundred books. Isn't that isn't that correct? And- yeah, I've been published in 112, I believe, titles, 45 languages. At Barnes and Noble, you'll always find at least uh, four or five titles at mm-hmm. the airports, at Kinko's. Uh, yeah, I, I got a couple honorary doctorates in literature and philosophy, and even a star. Check this out on the Walk of Fame in Vegas. Wow, yeah. Yeah. All for so cool. all for being an author for a guy who can't write and spell, and I'm dyslexic. Go figure. Now that's the interesting part that I want to to get to. So, what was school like? What was high school like for you, as as a student? Because as we all know, and in my opinion, the education system that exists today and what we pressure kids to all fit into a certain box or mold that don't necessarily fit into that um, is, 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 is difficult. And no kid, is, no one child is the same, just like no one adult is the same. What was it like for you being dyslexic, having difficulties writing, going through high school? 
well, how did how did you feel about that? What kind of support did you get? And what was your experience like as a teenager? Yeah, first we're going back 40 some odd years. So my I, my exact memories of well, yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, all, all I all I remember is that I made up for another way. So like I became president of the drama club and captain of the wrestling team. So I diverted. It's like everybody else. It's redirection. Look over here, right? And so <laughs> I didn't want anyone to look at my failing grade in math. So I was like, hey, check this out over here. Right. And so th that that's how I kind of got through life, and and you did your best. But the main thing is like even in today's society with my son, you know, he goes to a private yuppie school, and mm -hmm. you know trying to keep up with the Joneses and, and all that good stuff. It's just part of the culture of today's society. But what's really, really nice is I'm also saying that we send him to a very free range chicken type school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they walk to the beach and do classes down there. They, it's, it's a different environment than I grew up in. So right. it's not so exact structured. How nice. And so do you find that, um, you know, let's talk about your son. He's, he's eight, he's adorable um what do you find for for him for his schooling okay fine. it's a private school that's great but in the sense of how they uh do the classes in in his school where he goes to do you feel it's different than traditional schooling that they they have now and do you feel that it's a better way of instructing well, it is very different, and I do believe it's a better way of instruct. That's why I'm spending all that money to send him there. But the main thing is, is that he enjoys going because he gets to learn on his own level at his own speed. It's so funny. My former wife, Alan, she's I got the greatest ex-wife in the world, and we co-parent very well. And so we had a the first you know parent teacher conference, and the, I could tell the teacher was a little nervous because Colt wasn't getting the best grades. And, and his mom and I sat there and said, let's get this out of the air. Goes, we don't really mind what his grades are. It means absolutely zero to us. It was mm -hmm. nothing. As long as he enjoys going to school, he's trying, he's putting in the effort and he's getting along with people and working on social skills and EQ instead of just IQ. I go, we're good. And she, the teachers went oh, and just relaxed for the first time. And then we start really opening and communicating. So, well, here's what he could really use some help with. And we got him some tutors to help him in those areas. And now he's thriving and excelling. But what's interesting, so many people miss the simple communication. You mm -hmm. know, so they were worried and we were worried the whole bit. And this is the first interview I've ever done in my life talking about my kids' school. It's kind of cool. Yeah, well, I mean, it's that 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 topic is is really really important to me, and and kind of uh, putting that into into it because I know that you do a lot uh, with him, not only you know in schooling wise, but also in um, like I was telling you before, I saw the video this morning, and he has this mantra of "I am" and "I am" affirmations, and I think that that is really important for kids to start doing at such a young age. I am successful. I am wise. I, I don't remember all of them off the top <laughs> of my head. I've got his CD around here. Yeah. So it was interesting. I, uh, last year on Amazon, when he was a kid, he was only seven. He had the number one spoken album on Amazon. And he's just his mantra. And he says, I'm, my name's Colt. I'm happy. I'm powerful. I'm brave. I'm wise. I'm worthy. I'm successful. I help people. My name's Colt. And we put it to hip hop music and it kind yeah. of blew up and took off and it was, it was pretty, pretty neat. And now he's doing podcasts and sharing with other kids around the community. But what's really, really neat is that, you know, you learn something about your, yourself through your kids, obviously. Mm -hmm. And we're raising them in such a different generation. Imagine my, me growing up mm -hmm. and your generation, we grew up having seven minutes a day FaceTime with our fathers and with our, our parents and on average. And mm -hmm. in today's society, we spend so much time with them. And so where we go, oh, I never knew my parents. Well, my kid's gonna grow up and go, man, those guys would never go away. Right? They're always there. Right. It's, a, it's a different energy in a different time. So I'm constantly learning from him as much as I believe he's learning from me. But I'm teaching him even at seven, eight years old, the most basic stuff that they don't teach. For example, mm -hmm. um, you know, he wanted, he, every kid wants money, right? So I got him a debit card uh, on called Greenlight. I'm not a spokesperson, but it's amazing. And it's a mm -hmm. little debit card that they get with their name and their picture on there. And it's just a debit card. They can use it at ATM or buy things. And then wow. you can charge 
uh, you can add money to it if when they do their uh, assignments or however you want to gift them money, it goes directly to their own credit card or their debit card. And then they get to see credits and debits and how it works. And just recently we went to a, an event and my son was all cocky and he goes, oh, oh, I got this. I'm going to cover it for him and his friend. And it was like $50 and it cha-chinged his account. And he goes, dad, he goes, well, how much is that really? I go, well, you got to wash three of my cars when we get back to cover that. He goes, forget that. And I go, but that's <laughs> what money is. And then he start, they get to see exactly how it works. But a lot of times people don't discuss these simple, basic things with their kids. And I figure, heck, if he's seven, eight years old and learning it, imagine where he'd be when he's an adult. Exactly. No. And, and those are great lessons. I mean, I know when I grew up, we had an allowance every week. If we got to, we clean the house or did whatever it was that chores that we had to do. And I think it's also an important lesson for responsibility as well. Like things don't just come because you ask for them. They okay. Come All them. right. I, I got, I got the greatest aha I got ever <laughs> about that. I was doing a podcast with somebody and someone asked me this question. Uh-huh. And by the way, this is a weird paradigm shift. So I'm just going to give you right now, your head might hurt after. I'm <laughs> and they asked me that question. I go, do you give your kid an allowance for, you know, the, the things he doesn't, you know, taking out the trash, making the bed. Doing the fun? I go, yeah, I go, he's got to learn responsibility, everything we just said. And the gal goes, oh, that's a shame. I go, what? And she goes, so let me ask a question. Do you give your kid an allowance when he, you know, to, to do the, you know, pull weeds and all this different stuff? I go, absolutely. He's going to think and it's his money. He learns. She goes, she goes, uh, th that's just really disappointing. And I went, I don't get it. Why are you saying that? And she goes, think about it, Greg. She goes, you're training your child from the earliest memory. The only way to make money is to do something they hate. <laughs> and I went, wow. And so I sat him down and said, Colt, what are you good at? And he goes, well, I can make these videos and TikTok stuff. And I go, why don't I do this? Your new allowance will be based on you making some video memes and things for my Instagram and things of this nature. I'm going to reward you for you what you excel at. And I go, making the Ben stuff, we'll just call that a contribution for living in the great environment mm -hmm. that you have as part of your thing. And that paradigm shift changed everything for our relationship. That's really important too, because I, I, I even see that kind of like with, uh, you know, in consequences, like when sometimes, you know, my... In, in, in my family, you'll see where, oh, well, if you don't do that, you're going to have to, I, I'm going to make you read longer. Like reading supposed to be a wonderful thing. So if you're going to read longer, then, you know, you're making it be a consequence so that they, they look at it at a neg in a negative, in a negative light. And I saw where you were going with that. And well, I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't get paid a penny for doing stuff I don't like. Right. I only paid money to do what I like. And so it's very nice. But it's the people that have these okay. quote unquote dead end jobs that they don't like mm -hmm. it's because they're found a way to get paid money to do what they don't like. And there is a way to have that paradigm shift. Now, look, my son makes his bed, does his thing, but he never even complains about it. He just, that's just part of the life that he has. Right. On the, you know, when he wants to make dough, he can do it working his strengths. And I believe that you work your strengths and you hire your weaknesses. And that is the secret of all success. One last thing about your son is that in the video, in the, the, the end of the song, it says, you know, the, my favorite part was when the song said, it, it's time to train these kids for real. Cause if we don't society will, what is, what is the thought behind that? Well, unfortunately, if we do not teach our kids about financial matters, about mm -hmm. relationships, about, you know, even the tough things, the sex, the drugs, the different mm -hmm. things of this nature, well, society is going to give them the input from the TikToks and their friends and their associations and things they see online. And that becomes their truth. And it doesn't mean it's the real truth. So if we want to have values and morals and things of this nature to pass on to the next generation, we have to be the ones to have the courage to put it out there and show them that light so that they don't learn it from some other way. So you work with inner city youth. You do projects and programs um, with underprivileged children or, you know, in help in general for, for children. What exactly do you do and how did you start and get into that? Uh, what you're referring to is the first book I did a gazillion years ago called The Millionaire Mentor, where I mentor inner city kids in San Diego. I drive up in a new Ferrari and they say, hey, here comes my millionaire mentor. Became kind of a badge of honor. And so I, I believe the whole concept of giving back and surrounding yourself with amazing people but it's also, again, like I said, people go, why do you do so much charity work? 
And the answer is I'm the most selfish guy, you know, because I get so much out of it. And, and I truly have this weird philosophy. Imagine a giant fan is right here. Mm -hmm. Every time I tend to throw money or time or energy to those type of things, it comes right back in my face tenfold. So I, I try to throw as much as I can because I, I, I just know the way of laws of reser what is it? Reparosity. It tends to work. Yeah. <laughs> And by the way, this just shows you, I can't really read very well. I'm, play me words with friends, you'll win every single time. <laughs> and but I can sit there and get the message out. And then my ghostwriters go, blah, 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 and they write it really pretty. And it comes out in book form and people go, holy smokes, it's genius. Wow. Yeah. I mean, th and that's important because the more you, the more you give, the, it's just basically the more you give, the more you receive you know, type of type of a situation. And I, and, and that's wonderful. What do you think? I'm going to throw this out there to you that that our society quote unquote in your opinion has to do right now to help these children to change the education system to try and give them more opportunities than what they have today because not everybody is born in the you know with parents like you or parents like I had or in a scenario where you can kind of push on, but also even in my scenario, you know, I grew up that you need to work, you need to go have this job, you need to do all of these things, you need to go to college, you need to go to university, then after that, then you get a job, and then you live there, and then you have the white picket fence, and then you have two cars and a dog and a kids, and all of those things are ingrained in you, because that's what you think that life is, that's what you were taught. Yeah. What do you feel um, that for kids, nowadays in teens that don't have the mindset that you are or I have now need to do or what do you think needs to change about that to try and help them overcome being born into poverty or being born into uh, difficult circumstances? How can they, um, what can we, even us as adults do? And so all I can do is say from my point of view, okay? Mm -hmm. So just for clarity, the first two years of my son's education, we sent him to schools in the roughest part of our city. Mm -hmm. and so that way he saw you know, what life was really like. Now, yes, he goes at third grade and fourth grade to a different school, but for first, second, third, he, he, it was a whole different circumstance. Mm -hmm. So I believe that there's actually education to be learned in all parts of the society. And I wouldn't shun one side over the other because I think the School of Hard Knocks is an amazing life lesson. In fact, I look at the things that you just said as a challenge are also some of the greatest opportunities. And here's a reason why. The most successful people on this planet that have impacted this planet did not come from wealth and prosperity. Mm -hmm. They came from the most challenging situations and they grew out of it. So I believe the opposite. I think that those sometimes are some of the greatest opportunities because they give you that hunger and that desire and that strength to grow and expand, to make a big impact. So I wouldn't avoid one thing or the other. Um, I mm -hmm. just embrace both. Yeah, I, every, every rich kid I know, I'm not doing so great. That's why I'm working so hard with my son to focus on these different things so we could break that thing. If you go back and look at history and everyone Google this afterwards, the odds of having second generational wealth is uh, retaining it is so little, but third generation is you, you, you could, you, you, it's like winning the lottery and getting struck by lightning five times in a row. It mm -hmm. is, it's almost impossible. And the reason is, is because they get so lackadaisical and used to things being given to them rather than earning and working for it. Right. So like I said, sometimes coming from adverse situations could be the greatest life lessons and teachers to get you where you truly want to go. You're a, a, a successful entrepreneur, an international author, coach. You've been in Forbes, you've been in Inc. You've been multiple magazines, star on Las Vegas Walk of Fame. What, what was that journey like for you to get to that point? Because you had said at the beginning that you had struggled with, um, you know, with drug and alcohol abuse. And how were you able to overcome that? Uh, again, the, the, the drinking stuff, I was 24 years old when I quit. So 
yeah, it was a, a, a whole more than a double lifetime ago. Mm-hmm. So I don't, that's just not my life anymore. So I don't even right. really have a lot of even memories of that. But I will say in this industry from age 20 to 40, I only had one job. I sold advertising and then I ended up starting my own business and I sold it at, you know, 39, 40 years old. And then people asked me how I did it. And I started speaking at universities and, and sharing my success secrets. And some kids said, you should write a book. And I go, that's a great goal. I've never read a book. I go, that would be awesome. <laughs> so I went on that journey and I was turned down my first title for 268 publishers, agents, and printers in a row. Again, I can't spell. I can't write. I didn't know what I was doing. Right. And I never took it personally. You know, the, like the, the five agreements, I didn't take it personally. And so what happened was, or four agreements. And so what happened is that I, I, I really focused on hiring Ghostwriter finally, and they took my words and crafted it in a good way. And it went on to become a giant juggernaut. It was still my message, but it was written in a way people would want to read. So for example, I'd say, get off your ass. You know, boy wants to make some money, go mow some lawns, take action and go buy a bike. And then they took it and said, it was a glorious Sunday afternoon. A young bright eyed lad caught the entrepreneur. Right. And they wrote it in a book. And then it was still my right, message. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> And so when I read, I go, man, that's great. But you know, th- that's 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 the way that we do it, and that's how we do so many book projects. I just have some of the most amazing people around me. Obviously, a lot of times people look at failure and the idea of failure as something that is a negative scenario, negative, positive, or not good, so to speak. But mind you, without with, I mean, every highly successful person who in, in, in the world who has what they have today it is because just even like you said, it was how many times you were turned down that ultimately, eventually you persevered and, and got through that because without failure, you don't really know what success is. So what do you say to people that just ultimately want to give up? And do you think that, that because people give up so quickly that that's why they many people don't ever actually achieve their their goals okay well for people watching this what she's saying this is what i'm the world authority on so this is you're, you're opening up a pandora's box right now where we can go down a rabbit hole pretty good so for example, my biggest bestseller is called three feet from gold it's mm-hmm. about not giving up when you're that close to the to the finish line Mm -hmm. and there's first a dream and then there's a challenge and then comes victory unfortunately most people quit in the challenging times and the reason is for two one there's a difference between being committed and being interested being interested for example i'm going to open up a restaurant because it's a hot trend and i'm interested as soon as things go awry i'm going to probably fold up Mm -hmm. but if i inherit the family restaurant that's been in for 15 generations when things go awry i'm going to find a way to stick it through because i'm committed that's door number one and then the other one is the biggest challenge that we do is that we listen to people's opinions uh rather than counsel and the difference is opinions usually based on ignorance lack of knowledge or inexperience like family friends who've never done what you want counsels based on wisdom knowledge mentorship Mm -hmm. people pave the way if you had a family friend say i'm going to write a best-selling book they're going to try to protect me to keep me safe because they know I got a D in English and they've never written a best-selling book. But if I go to Mark Victor Hansen, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, he's going to say, here's what you need to know and give you counsel. If we would spend our activity only seeking counsel in our lives and ignoring people's opinion, that's the moment your life would change. Mm-hmm. And so what, what for those out there that are saying like, okay, so what's the difference between counsel and opinion? It's people that are getting the results that you want for yourself today. And I always add the word today because it's very important. So mm-hmm. I'll give an example. If I was going to open a new restaurant, well, my good buddy is Gene Landrum, who's founded Chuck E. Cheese, but he did that 40 years ago. I, I, I don't know if he would even know today, but I would go to the guys doing five guys or in and out or what the hot trend mm-hmm. is and ask them how to do it because they're getting the results we want. So when I wanted to become a best-selling author, I didn't go to Barnes and Noble and to the best written book section. I went to the best selling section and I called every one of them and said, Hey, what's the system? How's this work? And they taught me. And here we are today. Mm-hmm. When I went to Africa to climb Kilimanjaro, I did not ask a dope smoking surfer here in California <laughs> to take me to the roof of Africa. I found the Sherpa that I climbed it 900 times where they put a boot print, boot print. I just follow successful actions. So we can have anything and everything we want in our life. As long as we're surrounding ourselves with people that are getting the results we want. And does this tie into the idea of the mastermind? 
hundred percent. The mastermind is this single most important asset that we can do to separate ourselves from the 95% who dream of success to the 5% who actually achieve it. Uh, it's interesting. I, I founded something called the Mastermind Association, mm -hmm. where people could go online and actually become certified to learn how to run, host, and maintain their own mastermind groups. Because people go, well, I don't know how to join one. We'll start one. And I even do a private one you know, in San Diego myself uh, each and every year. And it's so funny because so many people have an excuse why not to go. I call it the bad case of the one size. It means I'm going to take action once I get the big break, once I'm worthy, once I, and, and that day never comes. The, the, when the golden opportunity is given to me and my friends, we figure out a way to do it. Even if we don't know, we just find a way to jump at it. Mm -hmm. And like right now, everyone watching this, uh, you go to mastermindgroup.com and you can check out my personal mastermind I'm at host this summer. Come to my house, come to my estate in San Diego, hang out with all my friends. No one will come. Trust me, no one's going to do it, but I invite you to because that is the difference between success and people setting themselves back. It's not the opportunities, it's taking action on them. So you actually invite people to come to your home to... To my mastermind group. Yeah. Well, it, you got to go through an application service and there's a, right, uh, a cash <laughs> and all that, but yeah, I mean, but I usually limit it to 10, 15 people and you'd be shocked, but the few people that do show up that do decide to come, it's mind boggling. Uh, but again, most people let their big butt stop them and not the one they're sitting on. They sit there and go, well, I'd go do that, but, and it's that, but that, that holds them back. When Napoleon Hill, wrote Think and Grow Rich. He had a meeting with the richest dude of the world. His name was Andrew Carnegie. Mm -hmm. And at a meeting, he says, work for me for free for 20 years and I'll send you on a mission to meet my friends and you'll write the first of our formula for success. And the point Hill says, not only will I accept that, but I'll complete the task. Well, what Hill didn't know is that Carnegie started a stopwatch and gave him 60 seconds to make up his mind to take that journey. And when Napoleon Hill agreed, there's 31 seconds left, meaning he made a life-changing decision in 29 seconds. But here's where it gets cool. Carnegie made that same offer to over 250 men before Napoleon Hill. He was the only person to say yes. Everyone else had a big butt or a bad case of the one size. So that's what I say. Everyone watching this, my cell phone number is 858-353-0432. You won't call it. But there you go. And wherever I go on stage, tens of thousands of people, I go, here's my cell phone. Here's my thing. Come to my stuff. And you'll be shocked and amazed how few people will really show up and suit up. And that's the only thing I did different. And that's the only thing my friends do different than everybody else. Wow. What do you think is that not, you know, so for example, I mean, I love Napoleon. I didn't actually know that story about, um, the point I knew that he did that with Andrew Carnegie, but I didn't know that Andrew Carnegie had done that. Asked, you know, 250 people prior to him and, and things like that. And I'll tell you that 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 book even in and of itself for me changed my whole life. And I'm thinking, why why wasn't I taught that so much sooner in my life? But I guess it just wasn't my time for it at that mo moment. Well, watch this when we did Think and Grow Rich mm -hmm. Three from Gold. I invited 300 people to come with me to go meet with the creators of NASCAR, the creators of Chick-fil-A, the inventors of string theory. The thing. Nobody came. Nobody. Not one person. Everyone had a story and reason why. And it wasn't until I did my follow-up book called Stickability and I charged people money and there was a value associated that then people paid money to come with me for the next one. And I realized a great lesson by Steve Sims. Unless they pay they won't pay attention. And so I started putting cost attached to our different things because those are the people that will commit themselves to actually show up because I couldn't give it away for free. But as soon as I started charging for it, that's where people came out and grows. It's interesting, right? Extremely. So people didn't see the value in going with you to have the opportunities to talk to those people yeah. in fact, when you didn't pay for it? And more importantly, no one would even show up and everyone had an excuse. And a lot of them were in my own living room. So they just had to like come across the street. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a trip and, uh, and it, but it, it is what it is. And I, I learned that great lesson from that, you know, Bob Proctor uh, and I did a book together it's called Think and Grow Rich Thoughts Are Things. 
-hmm. And we realized that thoughts were not things. It's only thoughts backed by your actions become realities Mm -hmm. because we sat down with neuroscientists that discovered we have 64,000 thoughts a day. Majority of them are called ants, automatic negative thoughts. And if everything was negative thoughts and we have 64,000, then everything would be drama and bad in our life. But that's not true. It's only the thoughts that we took action toward become our truth. How many times have we had a brilliant million dollar idea in the shower and by the time we brush our teeth, it's down the drain till 10 years later, we drive down and see a billboard with our idea. And it's only the thoughts in which we take our action become reality. So Mm -hmm. people say to me and they go, well, how do I know what you're thinking about? And I say, well, show me your truth and your surroundings and I can tell you what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. That's, That's incredible because it's true. I think a lot of people get dissuaded by the fact that, okay, well, it's not just going to appear, um, you know, no matter how anything comes up in life, you know, we didn't all, all become who we are today automatically, but there's that instant, uh, the desire to have everything in the moment. And when you have to see, okay, well, we have to make a plan and, you know, it's, it might take this amount of time and have to, you know, work towards it. And you don't know how, and all of these other things. And then, like you said, then all of the, but why I can't all comes up first. And then before you know it, like you said, by the time you're brushing your teeth, it's, it's, it's out the window, but that's, uh, that's very, very true. What, um, so tell me about, so that, uh, the mastermind is very interesting to me. I, I'd love to know more about that, but what about the secret knock as that's right behind you? Tell me about the secret knock. Well, that became an, by an accident. <laughs> it's like one of those interesting little kismet things. People kept, after we did three feet of gold and I kept talking on stage saying, Hey, no one went with me on this journey. They go, well, I want to meet your friends. And so I said, okay, great. I'll start I'll do a thing in my living room and invite a few of them. And they said, well, do I need a ticket? And I go, no, just do the secret knock when you come at the door bump, 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 as a joke. And, <laughs> off. and we end up becoming Inc. Forbes top event in the entire world for business mentoring and, and, um, and masterminding and networking. And so our next one's going to be in September. It's incredible. And again, I just did everything like from Seinfeld, it's the George Costanza opposite today. Instead of bragging about all the people you're going to meet and all the great stuff, I did reverse psychology and this is how we do it. We only have one rule to go, be cool. That Mm -hmm. means if the mics go out, we'll shout out. If you show up, there's no name tags, go meet somebody. Everyone's got to be treated equally and it costs three grand to go and we will not tell you where it is or who will be there. You just have to trust. And then right before the event, we say, well, here's the city and state so you can you know, book your flight. And then once you're there, we say, just so you know, this is where we're going to be. And by doing that, we've created the most incredible social gathering that's never been seen before. And the people that show up not only to attend, but to, you know, to, to share their wisdoms is mind boggling. I mean, I had President uh, Vicente Fox show up and mm-hmm. And, uh, and the first thing I said to him, I go, President Vicente, I go, let's go ahead and start this real slow and we'll work our inver- you know, conversation up. And he says, what is it? I go, I understand you're building me a wall. And he goes, you son of a guy. And he just started going off, right? But then he told the story about the Iraq war and how you know, George Bush and, and, and Condoleezza Rice came to his hacienda with this little vial and said that they have this these, these, these drugs that are the, these chemicals that are going to kill their people. And he, and he couldn't understand it. But when you hear a president tell a story of what it was really like, mm-hmm. it's amazing. You know, we had a private Skype with Edward Snowden while he's hiding in Russia. If we, if, our whole concept is instead of learning from coaches and teachers, what if you hung out with the person who's done it? Instead of watching the celebrity red carpet thing, come meet some Oscar winning actors. If you got an idea for a clothing line, here's the guy who did Ugg boots. If you got an invention, here's the guy who created the credit card magnetic strip and change banking. Imagine having tacos and hanging out with these people like this conversation here. And that's what Secret Knock, that's what my masterminds are all about. And that's incredible because if you think about it, even nowadays with the amount of money that people spend that is being spent on, on education, on, on college, on university, and, you know, in, 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 to have the ability to have the opportunity to actually go and learn from those people that have actually done 
these things and their stories is it's priceless really um, because everybody has a different story and everybody has a, a different way of doing things and you can learn you can learn you have so much more value in doing something in in that way as opposed to theory actually have it be applicable to life in general so yeah what do you think what is your what is your next project what are you um i i mean you have the mass run you have so right now um I, i'm working on two tv shows another movie my my latest movie is called wish man it's trending worldwide wow. on uh, netflix right now we were up for the oscar uh, last year. I mean, so it's really, really neat. I'm going more towards the entertainment space, I believe. And, and things are going that direction. And the reason is I realized I can write another hundred books and let's say that impacts another million lives. Mm -hmm. If I do one movie, that's tens of millions of lives in one shot. So I go, well, how can I duplicate my efforts to leave a bigger impact? And that's what I'm focusing on now. So tell me about some, but so tell me about some of the, the, can you, about some of the movies that you're working on or? No, I, 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 I'm doing a very commercial type of movie right now that I think is gonna be a giant success that'll come out in 22. Uh, I'm working on a really funky um, TV pilot and my other TV show that I can talk about, it's called Wake Up and Crush It. You can go on YouTube and watch the trailers mm -hmm. and things. And basically that is, is a day in the life of what it's like like to be a shark. It's, it's, it's my daily life where people come to the house every day and they want connections. They all want to meet my friends. They all want these access and resources. And I make them jump through a bunch of hoops to earn that right. Uh, and then I give them the ones that are worthy direct contacts with people that can impact their life forever. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. So it's wake up and crush it. Wake it's up and crush it. I have to watch that. I, mean, I don't know how I missed that one. <laughs> it, it, it's, 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 it was really, really fun to film. We did it right when Corona hit last year. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping when things open up, it'll open up again. I've been talking to the founder of the E Entertainment Network. who's a good buddy of mine to mentor me along the way. Um, and again, that's all we did. Like when we did Wish Man, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I don't know how to make a movie. And so what happened is I sat down with people that won Oscars. I sat down with people that started, you know, MTV and the guy who started, you know, Showtime Television and said, mm -hmm. hey, how does this work? And right now everyone's going, oh, it's easier for you, da, da, da. Yes, you didn't ever hear of me until this now. Never, not one of you have ever heard of me. They haven't heard of me either. The only difference is I reached out. That's right. it. And I did it with specificity. And here's the way, here's my great tr trick. If I want to get to the founder of, again, uh, Chick-fil-A restaurants, I wouldn't sit there and go, I want to pick your brain. I want to take you to lunch. I want to take you to dinner. How can I be of service? I can buy you a coffee. They, they don't want to meet you that way. What I would do is say, hey, listen, I'm working on a new book project. We call it three feet from gold. What mm -hmm. I need is 12.5 minutes of your time. I'll cover all my own expenses to get there. From the moment I open the door till the time I leave will be 12 and a half minutes. I'll start a stopwatch. I'm going to ask you one question. Why you didn't quit three feet from gold? Shut up. That's it. The chance of them doing that is so high because it's specific. It's in their own place. All I have to do is come down to the boardroom. It's 12 and a half minutes. That's it. That's it. That's my secret. And, and by, by keeping it that basic has opened up the doors to meet so many amazing human beings. Wow. So let me ask you a question. So when I had first originally written to you, if you, if you recall, because I'm sure you get a million things every day. And I think my initial one was about, you know, the children and, you know, kind of tying all those things into it. What was it, just, just to know for me personally, what was it that said, you know what, I think I'm going to uh, reach back out to her because you probably get a lot of messages on, on a regular basis. Well, I have a team that vets a lot. So they go through and do research to make sure everything's a good fit. And if they come back and say, this is a good fit, then I reach out back and we make it happen. And then also a lot of it is energy and people that we know of a sphere of influence. So for example, if a friend of mine says, Hey, you should talk to this person. It was a really great experience. And we, we continue to do that. And back to the thing, that's what I did with the specificity. So when I would meet with Chua Kathy, founder of Chick-fil-A, I'd say, Hey, but usually, and by the way, when you're there in 12 and a half minutes and you respect that and say, Hey, Time for me to go a hundred percent. They go, no, this is going great. Let me give you a tour around and you get a hangout. And okay. so that is what opens the door. And then when you're leaving, you say, Hey, by the way, who else could I 
meet uh, maybe your friends, your Rolodex, that would be a good fit. And then mm-hmm. they get on the phone and open these doors. Yeah, that's how these things happen. But you got to take that first step. Right. Um, that, that is the key to everything. All right. But if someone today who was sitting there and was a prisoner in their own mind and was like, I really want to do something. I'm, I'm sick of my life the way it is. What advice would you give them to actually take a step and get to acting on it? Okay. I'm going to give counsel. And uh, number one is sh- shut the hell up. Because <laughs> you don't want to put yourself in that circumstance. If you don't like the relationship that you're in, suck it up, sucker fish. You're the one who put yourself there. Do something about it. Mm-hmm. Have the accountability and responsibility to do that. Um, and then door number two is this is a big one. CPC. I wish I would have learned this when I was, you know, 20 years old because I just learned it a couple of years ago. Completely transformed everything. And when I share it with the audience, I guarantee you this is the nugget you wanted to write down mm-hmm. anyway. So everyone, I'm giving you Stalin here so you can grab something to write with. This is it. This is the big nugget. <laughs> Everybody get it. CPC is about accountability and responsibility for every single thing that happens. Stop blaming other people, number mm-hmm. one. And it works like this. CPC is an acronym, clues, patterns, choices. And it works like this. I'm a single guy. So if I go out on a first date and the woman happens to be 20 minutes late, there's a little clue. It's a little red flag, but anything could happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I go on the fifth, sixth, and seventh date, and every time she's 20 minutes late, well, that forms the P, a pattern. Now it's my C choice, whether I deal with it, yell at her, break up with her, but it's not her fault. She's just late. Stop trying to change people to fit in your own little paradigm box. But so many times we see someone with a bad reputation in business. They cheat your best friend. You do business thinking it'll be different for me. Things go wrong and you're mad at the person. It's like seeing a rattlesnake rattle, bite your kid's sister. You go to pet it, get bit, and you're mad at the snake. Mm-hmm. Looking back in life, rarely are we angry at the relationships we enter that didn't go good or the business practices that didn't end well. We're usually angry that we stayed in too long because we saw the clue, we saw the pattern, but we made our choices too late. Start taking accountability and responsibility. We sit back and go, look, things aren't going right. You saw a clue, you saw a pattern, start making better choices. That is excellent, excellent advice, counsel. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Take care, best of luck in everything and have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see you later, bye. Bye, Ann. And now a clip of Greg Reed's TED Talk speaking about missing opportunities when you could be just three feet from gold. Greetings, everyone. My name is Greg, and I'd like to spend the time that we have together today to talk about not giving up when we're faced with challenges and when we're faced with obstacles in our way. Throughout the day, you're going to be hearing incredible words of wisdom by many of today's top thought leaders. And the one thing they all have in common is the only way to see their dream come to fruition is to not give up when the going get tough. The fact is, there's always going to be challenges. It's not a matter of if, just a matter of when. And that's how we handle those adversities that makes up our character as a person. There's a great quote that says, we can learn more about someone on their one bad day than on all their good days put together. You know, it's easy to be happy-go-lucky when everything's going your direction, but it's when the chips are down, you learn everything about the character of how someone's going to react. And no story illustrates that better than the very first chapter of the number one best-selling book in personal development, Think and Grow Rich, by the late, great Napoleon Hill. And in there, he tells a story about three feet from gold. You see, there was this gold miner named R.U. Darby who got all excited. He went out west to Colorado and he found a little hole. Started digging in it and sure enough discovered a little nugget. He got all excited. So he buried it and hid it. He went home and told his family and friends so they could chip in money to buy equipment to pull it out by the truckload. Well, the first ore cart came up and it was filled with gold. Woohoo! They're going to be rich! But they kept digging and there was no more gold. They kept digging but there was no more gold. Finally defeated, Darby walks out of that mine and says, I quit, I'm through, and sees a junk man walking by. He says, hey buddy, give me $200, I'll sell you this mine and all the equipment, I'm going home. Well, the junk man realizing the equipment was worth thousands said, of course, you got yourself a deal. And Darby goes home defeated. But that junk man does something brilliant. He seeks the counsel 
of someone who's experienced in that industry, and he goes to a local engineer and says, what happened? Darby hit gold and ran out. The engineer starts laughing. He goes, oh my gosh. He goes, that's so simple. Everyone knows that gold runs in a straight line. It's called a gold vein. What Darby did is come in one side, hit gold, and pop back into dirt. He said, all you have to do is go back to where they discovered treasure, go 90 degrees the opposite direction, and you'll tap back into the vein. Not only did the junk man pull millions of dollars out, but it still fills Fort Knox today. And the moral is, how many times have we or someone we know quit one class short from a degree or sales or marketing? It's easy to quit it, but it's the people who persevere and go through the challenges that truly come out on top. And I wanted to test that theory for myself. So the last few years, I've had the opportunity to travel the entire world and meet with today's top thought leaders to ask them what they did to overcome their challenges, their adversities. The first gentleman I sat down with was a guy named Dave Linegar. And you might not know his name, but you know the business he created. In 1970, he wanted to get into the industry and the other economic collapse. And I asked him, I says, Dave, what was it like? Was it easy getting started? He goes, no, it was brutal. He goes, it was horrible. For two years, every phone call that came in was from a bill collector. He goes, I was so embarrassed when the phone would ring, I'd run across the hall and pick up the phone so my secretary wasn't put on the spot. He said, the third year, it got worse. They threw me in jail. They called me a liar and a cheat and a fraud. I said, what'd you do? He goes, I took my attitude from trying to prove the entire world wrong to something more admirable and prove myself right. I knew I wasn't what they were calling me. He says, I had the courage and the fortitude to pick up the phone. He says, I called every bill collector and says, look, I'm going to be honest. I don't got 50 grand I owe you, but I got $50 in my pocket. I'll send it to you today along with a promise that I won't quit. Don't give up on me. I won't give up on my dream. He says he called every bill collector every month until the fourth year. Someone finally believed in him, bought the first business, and that's what we know today as Remax Real Estate Corporation. And he says, forget about me and my success. I'm just a regular guy. But how many people's lives were changed because I would not quit? And how do we know that the person who's got the idea for the next American dream isn't about to fold in the tent because Visa's calling him right now? From there, I hopped on a plane and sat down with Jen Viev Boss, who started Pink Magazine. And I don't know about you, but I was going through some challenges these last few years. And I said, Jeff, I feel kind of like a failure. I feel like a loser because things aren't going the happy-go-lucky way that things were going for me in the past. And she said something very profound. She said, never let your mistakes, your setbacks, or circumstances determine your value as a person. I says, what do you mean? And she reached in her purse and she pulled out a crisp $100 bill. She goes, here, do you want this? Things were tough for me. Remember? I go, heck yeah. And she crumples it. She goes, here, do you still want it? I go, yes. She takes it, throws it to the ground and steps on it. She goes, do you still want that? I said, absolutely. She goes, why? I go, it's $100. Things are tight right now. Then she leaned in and said, then why is it when we're faced with challenges? We get crumpled, thrown to the ground, and stepped on. We think our value changes as a person. It's just part of the process and the journey of what we're going through. And I really wanted to test that. And I don't know about you, but I'm a huge fan of science. I read Discover Magazine, and there's something that was created many years ago by John Schwartz called string theory. You probably all heard of string theory before. But Albert Einstein on his deathbed couldn't figure it out, how everything was interwoven but John Schwartz did. He theorized the smallest molecular structure, as everyone knew, was an atom till they cut it in half and made fission. He goes, something smaller is called a cork, but holds corks together are these little strings that no one can see and they resonate. It's kind of like the building block of everything. He goes, that's why when you're in a football game and everyone's applauding, you feel that energy because everything is interwoven. But for 10 years, everyone in his family and friends, his peers, they shunned him. They laughed at him. They said his theory was ludicrous and out of his mind. 
until an entire decade goes by and Dr. Michael Green and him prove that theory to be the most likely source. And now John Schwartz is credited as being the father of what we know as string theory. And I asked him, I said, John, I gotta know, why is it for 10 years when everyone said you're crazy, everyone said you're out of your mind, you wouldn't quit? Why wouldn't you throw in the towel? He looks at me and said, I knew I was right. But how many people talk you out of your own dream? How many times do we let other people stinking thinking steal our goals? And then he said something extremely profound that changed my life and I share with you from him directly. He said the difference between someone who's successful and someone who's not is successful people seek counsel and ignorant people seek opinion. I says, what's the difference? And he says, well, opinion's usually based on ignorance or lack of knowledge. They've never done it before. Where experience and wisdom is counsel. So if you go to someone who's never written a book, for example, and I say, hey, I'm going to write a book. They might say, you can't do that. Why not? I don't know. You just can't. Well, that's their opinion. If I go to Mark Victor Hansen, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul and sold 100 million books, and say, Mark, I want to write a book. He's going to say, great, but before you get started, here's what you need to know and give me counsel based on all of his knowledge and experience. John Schwartz said if more people would spend their daily lives only seeking that counsel and in ignoring opinion, their lives would change accordingly. And people always say, you know, well, what was your favorite interview? Who's the favorite person you sat down with? And it's like picking your favorite child, but the most unlikely source came from Evander Holyfield. You know him, the boxing legend? He won more heavyweight championships than anyone else. And I asked him, I says, Evander, what makes you so special? He looks at me and said, I have a higher standard. I go, what do you mean? He says, if you have a car, so to speak, and so does your neighbor. He goes, if you will not tolerate your car being dirty or running bad, you have a higher standard, chances are you have a better car than your next door neighbor. He said, in sports, I showed up early, I left late, I invented exercises, I had a higher standard and I won more championships than anyone ever will. And then I asked him, I said, but you've had to be honest, didn't it hurt being in a fight? He goes, oh gosh, yeah. He goes, but when you're in the middle of a fight, you don't focus on the pain, you don't focus on the blows. As soon as you focus on the pain, Where do you think you end up? On your back, knocked out. He said, that's what people do outside the ring. They focus on the gas prices and the war and the economy, and they wonder why they never become a champion in their own quest. And then he pulled me in really tight and he said, you wanna know the funny thing? When you do win the championship, he said, everyone comes to their feet and they chant your name. They raise your hand in victory, and a guy comes out with a big shiny belt and puts it around your waist. And at that moment, at that second, you don't feel even one of the punches you took along the journey. But the guy in the losing locker room is going to feel every bruise for the rest of their life, wishing they had a higher standard. And although I don't know each and every one of you personally, I do know what we're going through. And when we're faced with challenges and we're faced with obstacles and we think there's no end, remember this simple line. Our greatest success and accomplishment is always going to come just one step beyond our greatest setback and failure. So if we're going through times where we think this is the bottom of the barrel, good news. (laughs) That means you're in good company. The test is this. When you know in your heart you're doing something right and you're on the right path, Don't ever let other people talk you out of your dream. Always seek the counsel, ignore the opinion, and never quit, never die, and never throw in the towel when you're just three feet from gold. All right, all right. Thank you all for tuning into tonight's episode of What's Up Punta Cana with Christy Maggio. I hope you got some really key advice and uh, lessons out of that interview with Greg. Like I said, I know I did, and um, I'm really excited and hope that this is a life-changing moment for my listeners and those that see this. So until next week, you can always hear uh, new episodes every Friday night at 8 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time on Punta Cana Hits Radio, and you can as well see all interviews 
on my YouTube site, What's Up Punta Cana with Christy Maggio. So until next time, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Take care.